Hello, welcome back to my study as we continue looking at the book of Daniel. And as we reach chapter 7, we see that there's a kind of, there's a change of pace, a change of emphasis. And the rest of the book looks very different to the first half of the book of Daniel. But just because it looks different, don't assume that the two don't fit together. Because there's lots going on that we can't immediately see. And one of the things to know is the different languages that this book is written in. Because part is written in Aramaic and part of it is written in Hebrew. Now, as you just read it in English, you think, oh, well, obviously the first six chapters must be in one language, and then from chapter seven onwards, something else. You've got to have two different things. You might even assume maybe it's two different writers, even. But it's not the case, because actually it's verses two to seven that are written in Aramaic. So there's something else going on here. And, and chapter 7, today's chapter, is almost a bridging chapter between these two different emphases in the writing. And we see more of how God gave Daniel gifts to, to use. Gifts even as he was in exile in Babylon. Now as, as we read it, if you've gone on and read ahead, you'll see this is, is quite strange and unusual sort of writing. It's called apocalyptic. The most famous example in the Bible, of course, is the book of Revelation. But we get lots of the same ideas here and the same sort of context in which they were written. Here in Daniel, you've got exiles living in, in Babylon. You've got a, an oppressive rule. You've got persecution all sorts of troubles come in. And in the book of Revelation, you've got the Christian community facing persecution from Nero. So a beleaguered people needing to know that God is in control. And uh, Dale Davis in his commentary gives us a, a definition of what apocalyptic literature is about. He says, roughly, I would say that biblical apocalyptic is a sort of prophecy that seeks to enlighten and encourage a people despised and cast off by the world with a vision of the God who will come to impose his kingdom on the wreckage and rebellion of human history. And it communicates this message through the use of wild, scary, imaginative, bizarre and head scratching imagery. Well, we'll see some of that head scratching imagery today, but hopefully by the time we've finished, we'll have a clearer idea of what's going on. Now, I am going to disappoint some of you now because I am not going to be cracking the code of this book, cracking the code of the future, telling you when the world will end. Now, there's plenty online that purports to be able to do that. But actually, that is not the author's purpose. And it's not God's purpose either. You see, our God isn't a fickle God who plays an escape room game with his people. No, God is a God who loves us and who wants to encourage. He doesn't obscure. He makes things clear. And there is a broader purpose that you've got to step back to see. Now, I was listening to a talk on this chapter by a chap called Mark Ashton. He was speaking at an event for ministers that the Proclamation Trust ran a few years ago. And he suggests that we look at this chapter rather as you would look at a picture. So you'd step back, you look at the whole picture. It's a picture, not a problem to solve. Now, of course, you can ask what different parts of that picture mean, but you don't lose sight of it as a whole and that's what we need to do with this chapter. We need to keep always before us the, the understanding that this is written to encourage God's beleaguered people in exile and to remind them of who is in charge. And there is a great message in it for us too. Now, as we look at the chapter, uh, there is a really interesting structure in it again. You know, I love things like that. And it's one of these structures, again, these concentric circle structures. If you look down at the text, you'll see that verses 1 and 28, the first and the last verses, 
they kind of top and tail it with Daniel and what happened to him. He had a dream and how he was feeling about all of it. Then our, our next circle in from the outside, we've got the description of Daniel's dream. And that's there in verses two to eight. And then we've got the uh, explanation of that dream in verses 15 to 26. So we've got the explanation in that next circle, the dream and its explanation. Then as we move in, we get the description of this ancient of days and of the son of man. And then right in the middle in verses 11 to 12, we have the complete destruction of evil. So that's what we're going to look at. That's how we're going to structure the chapter. And it really helps us to focus on what's going on. So let's start with that first verse. And we can see in the first verse that Daniel had a dream. Now, in itself, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because Daniel is the great um, understander of other people's dreams. But here he is having a dream himself. It's like the tables have been turned. And when was this dream? Well, it was in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So we've whizzed back a little bit in time, back to when that final king of Babylon had taken to the throne. Of course, it was a, a difficult year, wasn't it? Um, you'll remember Daniel himself had been sidelined. We saw what sort of a ruler Belshazzar was taking those cups that had been stolen from the temple in Jerusalem and using them to party with his friends and his wives and concubines. So that's, that's when it was happening. So what was Daniel's dream? Well, I'll, I'll just read it to you. Uh, verse 2, Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human being was given to it. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a lesser one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Wow, quite a vision. Uh, that, that fourth beast is a, is a little bit different, and we'll see that as we go on, because that's going to be significant. So that's the description and notice how Daniel responds to it. We're down uh, looking at the other half of this, this ring in verse 15. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. Well, notice he's responded just like King Nebuchadnezzar did to his dreams, hasn't he? He's troubled by it. And, you know, it is OK for godly people to be troubled by things sometimes when we don't understand we can be troubled as well it's not wrong it's not bad doesn't mean we've failed if we're troubled by something and Daniel needed to ask for help and it's interesting isn't it he's the dream interpreter extraordinaire but he needs help with his dream and, you know, it is OK to ask for help, even if it's in an area that is your area of gifting 
or expertise. Sometimes we all need just a little bit of help. And Daniel gets an answer which both explains and doesn't explain verses 17 and 18. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it for ever. Yes, for ever and ever. Well, it's, it seems very clear. It's like the interpretation in a nutshell. You've got, it's basically, it's going to be bad, but God's people will win through in the end. And that, that's great. That is the message of this chapter. But we're still left with questions, aren't we? And of course, Daniel was as well. Now, the question that we might have is, well, who are these four kings? Notice it's not what Daniel asks. And that's the clue that their identity isn't the most important thing here. When we get to chapter eight and we get another dream, we're told the identity of the animals that are seen. We're not told their identity here. And I think that that is significant and important. Nevertheless, for the curious, traditionally, they are understood in this way. The first beast, the lion, is understood as, as Babylon. The bear as the Medo-Persian Empire and the leopard as Greece. Now, there's books written on this subject. This is just the sort of the, the general kind of consensus. And what about the fourth beast? Well, often this is considered to be Rome because that's the next empire after Greece. And if you're somebody who holds to a, a later date for Daniel, sort of a second century BC, then you would be writing into that period. But actually, it doesn't really fit very well with Rome because um, here, this fourth kingdom is completely beaten, whereas Rome wasn't. It dragged on for a, a long while. And then there have been other kingdoms after Rome which have been brutal and harsh as well. So it doesn't really seem to fit. Even though God's kingdom is present through Jesus and through his church, it hasn't come in that fullest of sense yet, has it? So the best definition for me for for the, the fourth beast is that this is a kingdom yet to come. This is the last human kingdom before Jesus comes and reigns. So we maybe haven't seen it yet. And this last kingdom is the most terrible one. Of course, it's notable thing is it's got these 11 horns. We're told in verse 24 that these are kings. And this last of the horns, this little horn, which, you know, it's not very little when it comes to what it can do, is it? This little horn, it speaks boastfully. But worse than it speaking boastfully is what this horn does. In verse 21, we're told this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. And then in verse 25, he will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. So this last kingdom is is the worst one and it's doing terrible things to God's people. Persecution. Now it is all purposefully scary. Do you know, because the world we live in is scary in every age and I guess that's the point of the fourth kingdom really uh, because in every age we see kingdoms like this and this fourth one is going to be the worst of the lot but we see it now we see it in the 20th century we see it now in the 21st century Do you know, I've just been reading a book I finished it this morning set in Singapore during the Japanese occupation and it, it took the life of this this one lady Wang Di and she'd been abducted from her home. She was taken to be a, a comfort woman for the Japanese soldiers at the age of 17. And it described in detail some of the horrors that were inflicted upon her and upon the village that she came from. Terrible atrocities of war. And there's terrible atrocities going on in our world 
all of the time things that we don't even hear about we put on our television understandably it's all about the the coronavirus at the moment but there's stuff going on out there that we've got no idea about people are being butchered despots are ruling rebel groups and and all sorts of people are are inflicting unspeakable things on others successive regimes come along they oppress and they destroy and davis quotes barbara tuckman in her book the first salute she says revolutions produce other men not new men revolutions produce other men not new men and there is a lot of truth in that isn't it this is a realistic look at the world that we're living in and this world isn't moving on getting better and better and better is it that's what we'd like to think that's what the humanists say but actually if you just use your eyes and you look around you that is not what is happening things are scary well is this a hopeless picture well it might be if we left it there wouldn't it but that is not where god leaves it and as we as we look to our, our next ring it kind of crashes in quickly haven't we we've got this boastful horn in verse 8 but then verse 9 and i looked thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat well here is here is god and what's he doing He's just calmly taking his place on his throne, seated. He's not running around panicked. He's not disturbed by things going on that he's got no knowledge of or that he can't do anything about. It's a picture of somebody in control. He sits down. We've got a description of him. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. We've got this sort of this purity about him, this holiness, this dazzling spotlessness. And his throne was flaming with fire. Its wheels were all ablaze. Now fire is a big symbol, isn't it, in the in the Bible, a big symbol of God. We see fire in Genesis chapter fifteen and verse seven. I think it's verse 7, let me find where my notes is. Just left it all behind. Oh, 17, Genesis 15, verse 17, when God is making his covenant with Abraham. We see it in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, where God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush. Exodus 13, verse 21, where God appears as a, as a pillar of fire to guide his people in the wilderness. We also see fire as judgment as well. Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 to 2 when Aaron's sons offered unauthorised fire and God zapped them down with fire of his own. Those wheels, think about the, the fiery wheels on the chariot that takes Elijah up to heaven or, or the wheels as God leaves his temple in the book of Ezekiel. Yet it's all uh, a measured authority a measured fire isn't it because you've got the court the court is seated court is a place of order and the books were opened there's nothing rash going on here here is a measured decided act by the ruler of the universe and look at all of the people with him thousands upon thousands attended him 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him well Daniel can't count the people can he that's like whoa there's so many people there and who else is there well as we carry on our, our ring around uh, we look to verses 13 and 14 and here we've got one like a son of man and look at his description he's coming on the clouds of heaven and the clouds are also a symbol of God's presence. Remember the, the clouds on Mount Sinai when God was speaking to Moses and giving him the Ten Commandments. Clouds, the cloud that uh, led the, the uh, people in the wilderness. Remember it was the fire and the cloud. And um, Del Davis makes this comment in his book about this being a sign of divinity. He's quoting 
J. A. Emerton. He says, The act of coming with clouds suggests a theophany of Yahweh himself. If Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 does not refer to a divine being, then it is the only exception out of about 70 passages in the Old Testament. So it's quite decisive, isn't it? And we don't even need to know that really, do we, to work it out? Because verse 14, he was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Well, what a contrast with these human kingdoms. But most importantly for us, we know who this guy is. And not just because we can make a guess, but because Jesus tells us, doesn't he? Jesus himself tells us. Mark chapter 14, verse 62. Let me just find it. Mark chapter 14, verse 62. I thought I'd put a bookmark in this, but I clearly haven't. There's the book of Mark, right, keep going. Gives you time to find it anyway, doesn't it, when I'm finding it. Well, 14 verse 62. And you've got Jesus in front of the, the high priest. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. So Jesus identifies himself with this one like a son of man. Because that could just mean, that, that phrase son of man could just mean human being. But Jesus gives it a very specific meaning. He identifies himself with this one here, with the Ancient of Days. And so here is who is in charge. God is in charge. And squeezed in the middle of that, that description of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, squeezed in the middle is this little horn and you see no matter how powerful he appears to be how boastful how brutal he is his time is limited and will come to an end verse 11 i continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking i kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. It's destroyed. Evil done away with. God is in charge. And the other beasts as well, stripped of their authority, allowed to live for a period of time. Even that phrase, allowed to live for a period of time, it shows that God is in control, that these rulers are allowed to rule by God but their time is limited. There is a kingdom coming that is perfect and is eternal. And we see um, verses 26 and 27, they kind of flesh that out for us, don't they? The court will sit, his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. See, God is in control. God is in charge. And one day his people, his faithful people, will reign with him. And of course, this, this is what Jesus promises, isn't it? This is what Jesus says to his disciples. I confer on you, this is Luke 22, verse 29. I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And Jesus makes this promise specifically to his disciples. But it's not just for them. See, it's, it's broadened out. Because in Revelation chapter 3 verse 21, Jesus says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So here's the promise for God's faithful people. 
and Davis says, seeing this secret behind history may not keep God's people from pain, but should keep them from panic. We may still be fearful, but we should not be frantic. You see, we know, don't we, whatever life throws at us, whatever terrible things happen, and terrible things will happen, both to us and to the world around us, God is in control, and he has set a time when he is going to defeat evil for ever. Jesus broke its power at the cross, and we'll see that defeat in all its fullness when he returns. Jesus himself said, didn't he, John sixteen thirty three. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And isn't this a message we need to hear? You see, the Bible is such a realistic book. It doesn't paint us a fairy tale of, of how everything's lovely. It tells us, look, everything isn't lovely. There's horrible stuff, there's sin and there's evil, there's brutality, there's violence, there's cruelty. But God is going to bring it to an end. He's on his throne. There will be a court. There will be a call into account. God's people will be vindicated in the end. And Joe, you know, this is a God that I can trust. This is a God I can place my full hope and faith in. Because I know that he holds history. We've seen it, haven't we, through the book of Daniel. We saw it before in Luke's gospel, didn't we? It's a theme right the way through the scriptures. Here is a God we can hold on to, a God we can trust, even through difficult times. So I'm going to finish with a prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are seated on your throne in heaven. We thank you that Jesus is there on your right hand ruling. We thank you that one day your heavenly court will sit and the books will be opened. We thank you that wrongs will be righted. And we thank you for this wonderful promise that those who say faithful to you will reign with you in heaven. Oh, and, and Lord, as we think about that, we think, I am not worthy to sit there in heaven with you. That's not the place for me. And Lord, you know that in one sense, it isn't the place for any of us because we are sinful. We deserve to be destroyed along with these beasts because of our sin yet we we thank you for for Jesus Jesus who stood in our place who already took that punishment for us when he when he, he went to the cross in our place thank you that he has died that death so we don't have to thank you that because of him we will be able to take up these thrones in heaven Oh, it is so humbling, Heavenly Father, to, to think about that, to reflect on that. And I, for one, am so grateful. And I pray that you would open our eyes so that we can see your hand behind history. Help us not to be afraid when the beasts seem alive and ferocious. Help us to keep on trusting in you, the faithful one. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have got a few days now to take that in before we reconvene, we, hopefully with uh, by God's grace on Monday, to look at chapter 8. In the meantime, we've got our VE Day service um, tomorrow. Do uh, let me know if you want to be part of that so I can send the link. And then there'll be Sunday worship at half past 11 as we continue looking at 1 Peter. Well, have a good day everybody and God bless. Bye. <laughs>